to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking at a book, at a letter that Paul has written uh, that really speaks to the church in our present age. If you've read through, which I'm encouraging, you need to read through the book of 1 Corinthians multiple times. Um, matter of fact, I thought I was reading through it multiple times, but Wednesday night I talked to, or Wednesday afternoon I talked to uh, Jim Meyer and was, I like to, when the older guys come and the, the wiser, the, the wiser wise guys show up, I like to ask them questions to, to gain from their knowledge. And, and he was telling me the process uh, of his study. And he said, you know, when you read through a, a book like this, you know, you're reading through it 40 or 50, 60 times. I'm like, okay, I was thinking 15, 20 was good for me. And he's talking about 50, 60 and up to make sure you get the flow and, and, and everything of the letter. So I'm encouraging you to continually read through the book of First Corinthians, and you're going to see that it reflects, in many ways, the state of the church in the United States, in the West, um, and what we're going through today. Um, and it, and it, again, I remind you that sometimes when we're going through a book and we're looking for application, because we're looking at a letter written to someone else. So the primary application is to that group, but the secondary application is to us. Well, when you look at 1 Corinthians, yes, there's a primary application because there are specific things that church is going through, but it's not difficult to find the application for us. It's right there on the surface. There's not a lot of digging that's necessary. And so I think we're going to see that today. And it's good stuff today. We don't have a lot of negative things to look at today. It's very positive today because he really hasn't started uh, uh, smacking them around yet in his letter. So this is where we have been. If you remember, we've looked at the prologue. We've looked at his thanksgiving, the prayer of thanksgiving he offered. And we're just now digging into the report that came from Chloe's people, from that church in Chloe's house. He's first identified the divisions that have taken place in the church uh, and remember, it's not necessarily that it is actually people saying I am of Paul or Apollos or Cephas or of Christ. It's just he's using, uh, it, we find out in this next chapter, I think it is, or maybe it's chapter four, regardless. We find out that he says, you know, I, I've applied this to myself and Apollos figuratively so that you will learn not to go beyond what is written, okay? The point is that he's, he's understanding and pointing out to them that there are divisions schisms within the church and it's not good and so he's addressing that and part of his address concerning those divisions is he's looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ the the message of the cross versus man's wisdom because what is happening in this church is that they're following men they're following different men within the church because uh, this guy sounds wiser than this guy. This guy's a better teacher than this guy. This guy has a different approach than this guy. This guy seems to understand the things of the world better than this guy. So I follow him, but I follow him. Well, I follow him. And it's making divisions within the church. And so they are following man's wisdom. And so he pits the gospel of Jesus Christ against the wisdom of man. And what we find today is that he moves forward from there and points to the fact that they are an example of the wisdom of God. Let me read something to you before we dig in too deep. This is from a, a man I mentioned a few weeks ago that I discovered I had his commentary, didn't even know it. His last name is, uh, uh, his name is Roy Lauren. And he says this, the genius of the gospel has been in its consecrated spirit-filled men. It did not advance its cause by political influence of wealthy patrons from the no nobilities of society. It began in a cradle, was disciplined in a carpenter shop, tested on the highways and in homes, glorified through crucifixion, and sent worldwide through the lips and lives of common people. The instruments which have been employed by God have come from the humble walks of life. The early disciples were neither high-born nor highly cultured. 
The original disciples were manifestly ill-suited as purveyors of so great a message as the gospel. They were low-born peasants. They were uneducated. They were Jews whom the world despised. They belonged to the smallest geographical section of the ancient world. Prior to the crucifixion, they were a dozen weak, vacillating, incompetent men. After the, resur- uh, re- after the resurrection and Pentecost, they were bold, fearless, resolute, death-defying, intrepid revolutionists of a new life. The difference lay in the transforming of their natures and the indwelling of God in their lives. I think, man, that is such a great explanation of how God chose to save mankind through a message. Remember, Paul says, through the foolishness of, the proclam- of proclamation that God chose to save people. Not by the uh, following of man's wisdom that, that means you have to do something to earn your salvation. But it's through simply the proclamation of the message that God became man, died on the cross, was buried and rose again and offers salvation freely to anyone who will believe. It's a silly, stupid message in the eyes of the world because there's absolutely nothing we can do to earn that salvation. But beyond that, God chose these 12 ignorant men yeah, we have Matthew. He, he was probably the, one of the smart one of the group. We have the zealots who were basically um, lesser um, men than even Peter who, who flew off the handle at every turn. He had that foot and mouth disease, you know. Fishermen, uneducated, probably not the richest in their community. Looked down upon by the upper echelon of the religious community in Israel. And yet, God chose these men to spread the gospel and and do so in such a manner that within a matter of years, the gospel had spread throughout the Roman kingdom. That ought to be rather encouraging for us. Well, Paul, in verse 26, says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. Paul identifies here the wisdom of God displayed. And how is that wisdom of God displayed? Well, in verse 26, he tells us. He, again, he points to their calling. In verse 26, he begins with four. That's an explanatory word that he's using here. So he's wanting to explain the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let me give you an example. Let me illustrate this for you. Those of you in Corinth, consider the word literally means see or look. It means to direct your attention to something. And so he says, consider your calling. A calling here is a noun, so it's not a verb. It's not necessarily, well, it's, it's, it's a noun. He's speaking of the fact that look at who you were or are when God called you, when God gave you the invitation and drew you to himself, when he gave you the invitation to believe and become a child of God. Where were you? So we can say the same thing about ourselves. Look back. Was there something special about you that, that drew God's attention? Did you somehow in your persona have something that God said, I really like this guy. He's a really good fellow. I'm going to choose him. Or was it simply the fact that God, despite who you were and despite your place in society, chose you? And called you to himself. Well, that's what he's telling these people here in Corinth. Look at who you were when you were called. Look at who you are now. Because you probably haven't climbed the ladder of success in ancient Corinth at this point. And then he goes on, he says, 
there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, all according to the flesh. In other words, in a human viewpoint, when they looked at you, they did not see some wise man. They did not see someone in a, a powerful position. They did not see someone born into nobility. Now, we do need to recognize one thing here, and that is this. Again, going back to something that Lauren said, Lady Huntington was an English noblewoman of great distinction who had been converted under the street preaching of Roland Hill, a flaming evangelist. She remarked once that she owed her salvation to the letter M. If it had, if it had been not any wise, not any mighty, not any noble, she could not have been saved. The point being is that he's not saying none of them had a position. None of them were it's not that none of them were wise according to worldly standards, but not many. His point being that God chose these people for a purpose. There was a specific outcome that he desired. Look at 27. But in contrast, in contrast to having chosen the wise, the mighty, the noble, instead he has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Now I know there are a lot of people in here that are really bright, really smart, probably have higher IQs than I do because that's not really hard, let's face it, okay? And some of you laughing, you shouldn't laugh because your IQ is not as high as mine and, and it's a sad case, so... But I look at some of you, and I, and I think, you know, how do we, let me back up, how do we think of ourselves? Do we, do we look at ourselves and understand what, uh, what, is, what is happening? Where'd my projector go? It went to sleep. There we are. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt myself. But my screen went blank, so... Anyway, let me see if I can get back on track here. God has chosen the foolish things of the world. Think of it. Are you one of the foolish things of the world? Well, you know, I'm going to allow you to answer that question quietly to yourself. But there is an encouragement here that we don't have to reach some high and lofty level to be used by God. And thank God. Right? I mean, I look at myself and truly, I, I mean, I'm, there's nothing special about me. And I thank God that he's chosen, first of all, he chose to save me. I cannot imagine what life would be uh, as, as a lost person. I, I can't, I don't even want to ever have to think about that. And thank God I don't because my salvation is secure. But God has chosen people for no other reason than he has chosen that person. Does that make sense? God has chosen, is what he says, that God has chosen because of his own personal priorities. He decided to exercise grace on those whom he decided to exercise grace. It's his choice. And so he's making it clear to this church in Corinth. There, you, you did not merit this salvation. For God's chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Or, I'm sorry, uh, God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong and the base things of the world, the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. So here we go. Here's the man's wisdom, the pinnacle of human ability and wisdom, and God has chosen the things that are polar opposite to that and nullifies man's wisdom, makes it worth nothing. Because who would have ever thought that a God would become a man in order to die to pay man's penalty and then be exalted to rule over the universe? It makes no sense to man's wisdom. And God has done that for a purpose, which is what... Uh, the result is that he shows in verse 29. So that, the word there is, is a word of result. So here is the result. God having chosen the, 
the base things, the weak things. Here's the result. No man may boast before God. Aristotle, Plato, those who really developed the wisdom of the world, many names could be thrown in there. If somehow in their wisdom they recognized or, or came to the right conclusion and somehow earned the salvation because of that wisdom, they would be able to stand and boast before God. But God has made sure that no man would be able to boast. Not Paul, not Apollos, not Cephas, none of them. And this harkens back to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Look at what he says there. What are we to boast in? Nothing but the fact that we understand and know God. That's it. That's our ground for boasting. Nothing else. Paul says a very similar thing in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So God has hemmed mankind in and will not allow us to somehow be able to move up a ladder of success to the point where we can boast before him that somehow we have earned the right to be the children of God. It is a gift that is given. Well, Paul goes on in verses 30 and 31. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul points out here the purpose. Why did God do all that? First of all, we could just sum it up by saying this. God has engineered things in such a way that it is God alone who receives the glory through his son, Jesus Christ. Mankind cannot receive the glory. And what he says here in verse 30 Literally, the Greek says, but of him you are in Christ. Of God, of God's desire, of God's purpose, of God's doing. It's a good translation here in, in the New American Standard. By his doing, which includes his will and his work, you are in Christ Jesus. Now, I have tried, uh, I have tried to figure out this phrase, in Christ Jesus, because there are some who don't see this as a reflection of our position in Christ. And I've tried to understand that view and it does not hold water. Paul is saying that we are in Christ. That is our position is that now if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are in him. You have been baptized with him in his death and raised to walk in newness of life by the work of the Holy Spirit. So he says by God's, basically saying by God's grace, by his gracious action, he has placed us in Christ. And Christ, he says, became to us wisdom from God. In other words, Christ is the personified wisdom from God. He is a, the walking example of God's wisdom if you wish, you can turn with me to Colossians. If you don't wish, you can turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. This is one of my favorite passages. In Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may, may be encouraged 
having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom, in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy an empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is head over all rule and authority. Jesus Christ, the personified wisdom of God the Father. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Logos. When John wrote that, that term logos, according to the Greek world, referred to a source of wisdom. And, and, and John goes to great lengths. He's writing for a more Greek audience. And he goes to great lengths to show them that the wisdom of God took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul is warning this church in Corinth not to follow the wisdom of man, but follow the wisdom that we find, the true, the complete, the ultimate wisdom that we find in Jesus Christ. And he said, Jesus Christ became to us wisdom from God. And then he goes on and explains or expounds upon the wisdom of God using three words. First is, he uses that word that Jesus became righteousness. It is that declaration that not guilty declaration that provides us a, 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 the right standing before God. We find that only in Jesus Christ. That deals with our past, our salvation past, but it goes on into our future. And then he says that he also became sanctification. The, the word literally means to be set apart or set aside for the service of God in, in this context. So that we find it, he says, in Christ, the wisdom of Christ is seen in the fact that he has sanctified us. He has set us apart for God's glory. And it is something that is present and progressive. And then finally, he says, the wisdom of Christ is seen in our redemption. In the fact that we have been released from captivity. We have been released from the effects of the penalty of sin, and will be in the future be released from the very presence of sin. Now, I want you to take a moment and just look at this for a second. Righteousness, something declared just before God, something that's happened in the past with an ongoing result. Sanctification, something that began in the past but is progressively moving forward, hopefully moving forward in our daily lives, something that we will attain completely in the future. And then redemption, again, something that began at that moment we believed in Jesus Christ and that redemption we will ultimately experience when we stand face to face with him. What is John saying here? The wisdom of God answers all the big questions of life. In particular here, how do we, how do we become right with the supreme being? Through Jesus Christ. Righteousness, justification. How are we supposed to live? The great question of philosophy, ethics. How, how should we live? In Christ, we find that he is our sanctification and provides us with the path to walk, to live a day, daily life. Redemption, where is our future lie? What is going to happen when we're gone from this earth? Redemption answers the question for the Christian in that we will be utterly set free from even the presence of sin. 
There's the wisdom of God expressed in Jesus Christ. And again, Paul directs us in verse 31 to the purpose so that he who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. Again, we've already looked at that. So what does all this mean for us? Well, once again, I, I just reiterate the fact that we don't have to dig a lot to find application for ourselves. First of all, the Corinthians were illustrations of God's wisdom. He chose them for their lack of earthly wisdom, for their lack of being held up in a noble position or having some position of great power or authority. And I can look at myself. I come from a lower middle class family. My dad was in the Air Force for 20 years, worked civil service for another 20 years or so. And I'm sure they scraped by to, to make ends meet. People would look at us and say, there's nothing special about those Spurlins. And I think the Spurlins would look at ourselves and say, yeah, you're right, there's not. And yet God has chosen my entire family to, to my knowledge. Chose to save us. Chose to use us to spread the gospel in various ways, various capacities. Not all of us are doing that, but that's their problem. I can't help, help that. Now look at, you know, look at yourselves. I mean, yeah, we do have some who are, well, I don't know that we have any of noble birth. If, if we do, uh, I'll bow to you later. Uh, you know, I don't know. I know we have some wise guys in here. But I also know that we do have some, some wise men. But I think that wisdom is probably something that's grown out of their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe they'd be wise by earthly standards in some other areas. I don't know. But we are just like those, we are just like those uh, Corinthians. God has chosen us for a purpose to frustrate uh, the things of this world. Also, Number two, he does all of this for his glory. He has placed us in Christ for his glory. We need to learn to live for his glory and by his wisdom. Because as we live by his wisdom, we bring him glory. That's all I have today. So we did make it out of chapter one. Thank you very much. We'll spend the next seven months in chapter two. I don't know. Happy Father's Day. I'm glad to see so many fathers here. I thank God for my father. Um, not a perfect man, but a very good man. A, a, a man who loves the Lord with all his heart. And uh, tried to raise three boys to love the Lord. And uh, I just praise God for him. Pray for him if you would. He has a couple health issues that have crept up that uh, they don't know what's going on, so he's ha he has a test that they're going to be doing on Tuesday. So if you would pray for him, let's pray together. Father, we love you and thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Pray that we have handled it correctly. And pray that the handling of your word um, today would bring you glory and would bring growth to us. And as always, Father, I do pray that you would help us to be zealous to share the gospel with those who need to hear. Help us to be better equipped as we leave this place and more motivated to share the truth with a world that is more and more daily believing the lie from Satan. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing us to become your children. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with me. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel. 
For I'm part of the family, the family of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Have a great week.